What's up everybody, I'm seeing a lot of people from the cinematography and video shooting world coming over into the audio side of things, wanting to get better quality, more professional sound, and I think that's awesome. But audio can be really challenging to get started in if you don't necessarily know where to begin. There are a lot of ideas that translate between those two worlds though, so I want to make a few basic comparisons that'll help anybody coming from the world of picture understand some fundamentals about getting great audio, from everything about what you need in terms of gear and why, to what different settings and parameters you want to look for to get the best sound. Before we get started, if you enjoy these videos, you want to support my channel, head over to alexnickerbacher.com. I've got a whole collection of sound effects that I'm curating from my personal library for your royalty-free use on any project that you're working on. I've also got my first course up on Udemy all about how to build and use a professional mixing template for post-production sound of all kind. So check those links out in the description down below. Anything really helps me spend more time on this channel sharing major studio workflows and ideas with everybody. I think it's safe to say that if you had to pick any one component of a camera rig to be the most important one, it would probably be a camera lens. If you have a great lens that's really sharp, doesn't have any errors, any chromatic aberration or anything like that, you can get awesome looking footage on pretty much any camera you might be using it with. If you don't have a great lens, then you could be shooting on an Ari Alexa or on a Red Komodo or something like that, and it doesn't matter how good the sensor in the camera is, you're only going to be able to do so much with the footage because that lens is going to be your primary limiting factor. The same idea applies to microphones. Microphones can be thought of in exactly the same ways as camera lenses. There are different ones for very specific purposes. They all have their different looks and feels. They color the sound that comes into them in very specific ways between all of them. Some are designed to sound extremely transparent and accurate. Others are designed to pick up very specific sounds and make them a little bit sweeter or accentuate certain things about them. There are all kinds of different mics out there, just like there are all kinds of different lenses, but it's really important when you're selecting a microphone, the same thought process that you'd use with a camera lens can apply. Whatever it is that you're going to be capturing the most of, whatever you're going to be primarily focusing on with that microphone, you want to tailor that selection to that as much as possible. Of course, there are good general things. Any kit lens from a Canon or a Nikon rig can translate into pretty much any cardioid or super cardioid microphone that you can get on the market these days. So there's a lot of general purpose microphones that are going to be pretty solid. But once you start getting into the specialty sort of stuff, it gives you that same kind of openness and real possibility that high-end camera lenses do. There are some types of mics that really shine on percussion instruments that also are really good for recording gunshots or explosions or sound effects, things like that. That. A lot of the microphones that are for really quiet, delicate sorts of sounds will translate between both quiet atmosphere recording as well as really interesting and delicate instrument recording. There's a lot of crosstalk there. So matching the purpose of a microphone with the actual application is really helpful in getting the best sound out of whatever you're working with. And of course, you wouldn't be able to use a lens without some kind of camera body, the same way you wouldn't be able to use a microphone without some kind of recorder. A recorder's job, in principle, is to capture whatever is coming in from the microphone in as clear and pristine a way as possible. These days, with everything being digital, it's all about representing the microphone's actual characteristics and the sound being captured without any kind of coloration or distortion. Back in the analog tape days, which some analog recorders are still used in certain capacities. It was all about getting that same idea, but you also had the coloration of the tape, just like you had coloration of the light coming into a lens that landed on film. The same way you'd buy a camera body for maybe features and ergonomics, same idea with recorders. There are plenty of different options on both sides that of course, answer a lot of those different needs, but when you start getting into the higher end stuff, it really does narrow down into very specific preferences. So you have companies like Sound Devices making the 8 series recorders, which are really, really awesome. Also, the MixPre series, which are a little bit more on the entry level side of things, but still really professional quality. I'd kind of make the comparison between maybe Canon's 1D lineup with all of the 8 series recorders, and maybe the EOS R series with the MixPre's, where again, it's not like these things are totally inexpensive necessarily, but you can get really high quality and professional stuff out of both of those lineups and still stay in that same family. The big thing with camera bodies is image quality, and I think the biggest contributing factors besides the actual architecture of the sensors, which gets really complicated, is the megapixel count, 
or the resolution of the files that you're able to create, and the bit depth, which is how accurate the color representation is going to be right out of a camera body. The same kind of applies in the sound recorder world with sample rate and bit depth. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but basically with higher resolution images, higher megapixel count, you can capture more information. And with bit depth, that information is going to be that much more accurately represented out of the digital sensor. On the sound side of things, the sample rate allows you to capture a whole lot more frequencies and a lot more information from the sounds coming in. And the bit depth does the exact same thing. It's a representation of how accurate those actual samples captured will be. And when I'm talking about accuracy, it's the same idea as there as well. To have a great camera body with a great sensor, you want as many colors of the spectrum represented as thoroughly and as accurately as possible to what they actually are in real life. In the sound side of things, you want as many frequencies as possible represented as accurately in loudness and in actual frequency as you can to real life. Then naturally, once you've captured that information, you need to be able to store it in some way. That's where file types come in, specifically raw files versus compressed files. Raw files in the camera world are, of course, a lot more flexible. They contain all of the light information that the sensor has actually captured, and you can do a lot more with them as a result. Whereas JPEG files, which are compressed, or maybe H.264 files in the video world, they've kind of truncated as much information about color and movement as possible so that they can get small file sizes that are able to be passed around much more easily. The exact same thing is true on the sound side. You have broadcast wave files or AIFs as usually the standard of uncompressed audio, where all of the information that you've just captured is represented the entire time as thoroughly as possible, versus MP3 files or AUG files, which do as much as they can to throw away all of the inaudible information that in theory you're not going to be able to hear anyway, but in practice generally degrades the audio pretty significantly. So JPEG versus MP3 and RAW files versus WAV files are about the same comparison. You can do a lot more and you get a lot more information and better quality out of RAW files, but if you just want to pass files around really quickly and you don't necessarily care about that as much, lower resolution and compressed files will get you where you need to go. And finally, I want to touch on frame rate in the video and audio world. A lot of people will equate frame rate in video to sample rate in audio, and that's not quite a fair comparison because in actuality, frame rates between sound and picture mean the same thing and do the same thing. It's all about keeping audio and video in sync. And when you have a frame rate in picture, you want to match that frame rate with the audio that's being recorded. That's independent of sample rate entirely. When I'm doing anything in the film world, I'm working at a 48 kilohertz sampling rate at the very least, because not only is that the standard for post-production, but it also is kind of the baseline in terms of quality about which frequencies I'm gonna be capturing. And of course, higher sample rates allow me to pitch and stretch and process audio that much more effectively. The frame rate of audio should always match the frame rate of whatever video is being shot along with the audio. And that way, when you go to sync everything up in post post-production, usually everything is based around timecode. Timecode is great for being able to put sync back together when audio and video were recorded on independent devices. Sometimes it makes sense to run everything into a single camera. A lot of YouTube content is done that way. But when it comes to more complicated workflows on features or television, maybe when you have multiple different cameras working, you need some kind of sync point and reference so that when you line up all that footage and you start cutting it, it can actually be an easy process rather than having kind of guess at sync and put things together manually, which having had to do that on many projects, it is very, very challenging and it's a lot more time consuming than actually getting the real creative and technical work done. Time code in and of itself is a pretty simple concept. It's just a clock and sort of like syncing watches, you can sync multiple different devices with one source of time code and it'll keep all those devices in the same rough sync across an entire shoot. Where it starts getting complex is when you have multiple different cameras running multiple different frame rates and you need all your audio to sync up. That's a whole deep dive unto itself, but a lot of the time, a lot of these softwares like Premiere or DaVinci or Avid Media Composer all do a really good job of kind of helping an editor get to the point that that's a little easier than it could be. That being said, if you want to know how to get time code specifically set up properly, I would highly recommend doing some research into what's called jamming sync. 
Jamsync is all about taking timecode from one device and just piping it into other devices and making sure that everything runs off the same universal clock so that they're all in sync across any shoot. Beyond that, the idea of sync can actually get pretty complex, but suffice to say, when it comes to frame rates in audio, it's all about keeping time with a camera and with other devices. It's not about the sample rate or the bit depth or anything else. Frame rate is totally independent. Now, obviously, there's way more that goes into sound than just these concepts, but I hope on a basic level, this helps translate some of the ideas and the mindsets from video and from still frame images into sound recording. So if you're coming from one world or the other, you can get a lot of those same skills and thought processes back and forth, and they'll all still be useful. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit like, hit subscribe, comment below with any questions you might have about the fundamentals of sound. I'm over on Instagram at AXK, so come follow me over there. And as always, thanks for watching.